All right, good morning. There we go. Friends, good morning. It is so good to see all of you. Welcome to worship here at Second Presbyterian Church. My name is Kristen Regal. I'm one of the pastors, and we're delighted that you are joining us for worship this morning as we continue our Impressions sermon series and as we explore how the arts can nurture spirituality. At Second, we are young and old. We are gay and straight. We are people who walk and people who roll, and we are people who come from many different socioeconomic backgrounds. And one thing is true of all of us, we are loved by God. So know that no matter who you are, you have a place here, you already belong. As a way of extending welcome to one another, I invite you to grab the connection cards on the inside aisle to write your name, and if you're visiting with us, to leave your contact information so we can reach out in the week ahead. And as it comes back down, just take a note of the people who are worshiping around you. Um, As we get started this morning, I've got a couple of announcements to share. The first of which is today is our Sunday lunch. We invite you to join us after worship for a great, delicious meal that will be happening downstairs in Westminster Hall. Second of all, uh, later this month, on July 29th to 30th, we will be sponsoring our anti-racism group. will be sponsoring a trip to Oklahoma to learn from our indigenous neighbors. If you're interested in being part of that trip, you can reach out to Bill Timaeus or Deb Meinke. We would love to have you join us for this Friday to Saturday adventure. Uh, next up, um, this September, we are excited to announce that our women's retreat is coming back. So we invite you to save the dates. That will be from September 23rd to 25th, and registration is now open. Um, Lastly, I want to invite uh, Katie Thompson to come up and share an announcement about this week's 707. Hi, good morning. As Kristen said, my name is Katie Thompson, and my family and I are new-ish members here at Second. Um, I'm also a recently joined member of the Family Ministries Committee, as well as a participant in the Anti-Racism Committee alongside my husband, Peter. And we have three kiddos, uh, Liam, Adelaide, and Zion. I had to look at my notes for that one. (laughs) I do know them. I do know them. (laughs) Just a little nervous. Uh, This summer, my family has been enjoying the front porch concerts that happen here on Wednesday nights at 7.07 on Seconds Front Porch. We have enjoyed listening to local artists perform, soaking in the summer evenings, and sharing community with others. My young kids connect more to some of the artist genres than others. That's why we're so excited about this week's 707 Front Porch Concert, which will feature the one and only Dinosaur, aka Dino Odell. Uh, Before 2003, Dino was an elementary music and drama teacher by day and a folk rock and reggae musician by night. Uh, Now, with over a decade of experience as a family entertainer, his live shows and studio recordings reflect his time as both an educator and performer. Going in and out here. Dino's interactive songs and tall tales engage curiosity, inspire laughter, and stir the imaginations of all ages. So whether you're a family with young kids or you just really like kids' music, we invite you to join us on this special family fr- for this special family-friendly f- performance on Wednesday at 707. If you have neighbors, grandkids, or other families and friends you'd like to invite with young children, please do. We'd love to have um, you invite them. The more the merrier, and we hope to see you there. So we hope you can join us the 707. Um, before we get started, I have one more announcement to make, which, we are, which is that we are very excited to announce that we have a new facilities manager, Phil Cooper. And so, Phil, I'm going to have you stand up and wave to everyone. So let's give him a round of applause. So Phil is going to be sticking around for the Sunday lunch afterwards, so we invite you to come on down to introduce yourself and to get to know him. You've survived, what, a week and a half so far, two weeks, and he keeps coming back, which is great. Uh, We are excited to have him be part of the team, and we look forward to you getting to know him and vice versa. Friends, let's now take a moment to center our hearts and minds for worship. Let us take a moment to be present in this space and in the presence of God. Friends, let us worship the living God this day.
Good morning. Good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nick Pickerell. Uh, I've been the organizer of the Open Table here for the last eight years. Uh, I remember eight years ago, on, uh, I was hired on May 1st, but I remember auditioning, auditioning, <laughs> I mean, I guess, sure. <laughs> I mean, they did have me, they did have me like recreate a service for them, so they'd be like, hmm, do we want to hire this guy? Um, but I, I remember way back when, uh, I, I was living in uh, Cherithbrook, Catholic Worker, and I was six months removed from that, and I was looking for something else to do, and I saw this job description pop up. Uh, come, come across my desk, and I was like, hmm, they want to hire someone to create something uh, wild and new. I was like, okay, I'll give that a go. And, uh, you know, the open table did not disappoint. It's been a lot of it, uh, fun, adventurous sorts of things that we've gotten to do over the last seven years. And for those of you who don't know who the, what the open table is, we are um, a dinner church. We are a community of liberation and healing in Kansas City. And we meet every second and fourth Sunday night, and our, our kind of niche, our, the, the thing that we focus on is we try to engage in dialogue around the intersection of social issues and spirituality. So um, that is a little bit about me. So why don't we rise in body or spirit, and let's join together in the call to worship. We begin our worship today with the poetry of Amanda Gorman, who writes... Lumen means both the cavity of an organ, literally an opening, and a unit of luminous flux, literally a measurement of how lit the source is. Illuminate us. That is, we too are this bodied unit of flare, the gap for lux to breach. Now we're ready to worship God, luminous and illuminated. Our first song this morning is Hymn 33, all three verses. Let's join together in the prayer of reflection and renewal. Again, in the words of poet Amanda Gorman, it is easy to harp, harder to hope. Or again from the same poem, since the world is round, there is no way to walk away from each other. For even then, we are coming back together. Energizing God, shift our lives from harping to hoping. Remake our habit 
a walking away from one another, and an expected coming back together. Amen. Now hear this assurance of God's grace. Friends, God could have kept distance, complaining of our failures to love. But God has in fact drawn near to us in Jesus the Christ. When we walked away from God and others, God goes into exile with us, refusing to let us go, refusing to let us settle for lives that are small and unlovely. You are forgiven and freed for lives of hope and connection. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Good morning. I want to invite all the kids up uh, to have a little chat with me. So if you're any, however old, up through fifth or sixth grade, come and I have a fun story to share with you. Hi, everybody. Hey, welcome back. I heard you had a big trip. You got to tell me about it. Hi. Hey, Oliver, Sam, come on. Y'all come have a seat. Uh, well, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good? Good. Well, I have um, a story to tell you because I just got back from Alaska. Does anyone know where Alaska is? No, it's way up and way over. You have to fly on an airplane for a very, very long time to be there. Yeah, it's one of the states in America. It takes the whole day and the whole night. Yes. Yeah, for real. For real. Um, can you tell me anything you know about Alaska? What do you, what do you know? You might know more because you had siblings go on this trip, huh? It had glaciers. It was cold. It was 60 and sunny. It was, mm, oh, it was wonderful. Yeah. Anything else? Huh? It starts with the letter A. Yes? So um, I want to share with you, in the Bible, in the Bible, there's a story at the very, very, very beginning where God is creating all the things. And one of the days of creation, God creates the water. He separates the water out, makes the sky and the ocean. And then he puts birds in the sky and fish in the sea. And so I thought after coming back from Alaska, I would tell you about one of the animals that I learned about there. Does anyone know what a salmon is? What kind of animal is a salmon? It's a fish. That's right. And maybe, maybe sometimes you eat, you, maybe your families eat salmon. It's very, very good fish. Can you tell me how big you think a salmon is? Is it this big? It's a little bit bigger? It's a little bigger? Well, I'm here to tell you, our group caught salmon that were this big, and they were beautiful. Um, but salmon are really, really interesting fish. And I'm going to tell you what their life is like, okay? So I want you to imagine a little stream. A little river. The water's not really that deep, maybe just maybe a foot deep or so. And these big fish, these old, old fish, they lay their eggs. And then the salmon, the little salmon hatch out of these eggs and they start their life. And they swim around in the little stream. And then when they get just big enough to kind of swim on their own, they start swimming down the stream. And that stream becomes a little bit bigger and becomes a creek and becomes a river and then they swim down the river for a really long time until they hit the ocean. And they spend, I mean, weeks doing this. And all long time, all they're doing is eating as much food as they possibly can. And they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and fun. What about what? The sharks. The sharks they do have to be careful because of the sharks, right? Um, but they have more whales. They have more whales up there. Um, but there's so many, there's so many fish, so many salmon. And so they go out and they go miles and miles and miles and miles and miles from, from where they were born. And they get out to the ocean and their only job is to eat. And they eat everything that they can find until they get really big. And then something in their brain says, it's time to go home. And the salmon all at the same time make the decision of we have to go home. Now, it's easy. Have you, gone, have you ever gone down like a, slide, a water slide? Like the water slide's easy to go down, right? Have you ever tried to climb up? 
It's really slippery, right? And you're going to get the waters trying to push you down. So the salmon were easy. You just kind of float down the river to the ocean. But when they have to go home, they have to turn around and they have to start swimming upstream. And they do. They start swimming and they start swimming and they go upstream. And then they hit like a point where the ocean kind of comes into and there's like four or five different rivers. And you know what? Their sense of smell, they can smell in the water, which is a weird thought, right? But they can smell the water from their home stream. It might just be a little bit, but they can sniff it. And so they like, that's the river. So they get into the river and they swim and they swim and they swim and they swim. And then that river breaks into a whole bunch of little creeks and they sniff again. And they're like, that's it. That's the way to my home. And so they go down until they find the spot where they were born. And then they lay their eggs and those eggs hatch and they go and the cycle starts over. Is that incredible? Yeah, they think they can get so far away, so far away. And it's like, it's like, can you, if you were to sniff right now, could you, could you find your way home? Maybe you two. Y'all live really close. I bet y'all, y'all, y'all could probably make it. But these fish, isn't that amazing? God created these animals that wanted to remember where they came from. And so they spend their whole lives going out into the ocean so that they can swim back. And along the way, they eat and they get caught and all this kind of stuff along the way. Um, But it's an amazing story. Yeah, Jenny. God did make gravity. Yeah, we'll have that conversation. Um, So I wanted to tell you that story because being able to see, it was just really, it was beautiful. And I hope that you get a chance um, to go on a big adventure. Uh, And when you do, I want you to look around and see all the incredible things that God created. Um, Because God, when God created it, God said it was very, very good. All right? Hey, would y'all be willing to pray with me real quick? Sam. Hey, Sam, sit up for a second. I'm going to pray for us real quick, and then you can go back to your seat. Will you pray with me? Okay. Ready? God, thank you so much for all the beauty of your creation. Thank you for the salmon and the fish and the dogs and the cats and all the things that you have created in the world. Help us take good care of them and help us marvel at all the wonderful things you have created. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, just as a reminder, we're on Sunday school hiatus right now. So we are, we're planning our big kickoff here in a few weeks. But for today, we're all going to stay in the service together. So if you would like to, there's a coloring station over there. There's also clipboards at the beginning uh, or at the entrances to the, to the service. If you want to color at your seat, um, there's crayons and coloring pages that you can get there as well. All right. Um, And if you need the nursery, just remember we've moved it. It's right around the corner here um, by the elevator. Um, And we have our service streamed in there. Thank you, Richard Ridge and Alex, for getting that space set up for us. All right? So you can go back to your seat. And as you do, I'm going to invite everybody to stand, if you would, and say hello to someone around you. Um, Spread the peace of Christ to one another. Good morning. It it normally takes three or four good mornings to uh, quell the energy. Uh, Jimmy, I'm not saying I enjoyed watching people not listen to your sermon, but I sort of did. 
because uh, it makes me feel better. When I was growing up, there would always be this one Sunday every year, the Wimbledon final. I would beg my parents to let me stay home from church, uh, and I never got to. They're like, no, we're going. So we all bear our crosses, but I just want you to know that I'm here suffering today <laughs> as Djokovic and Kyrgios play. And Alex, I know we're not supposed to turn our second Sunday lunch into a sports bar, but just in case it goes to five sets and it's still on, if there's any chance you could hook up my YouTube TV in Westminster, I would be really grateful. Okay. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord. Um, this morning's sermon is entitled Art and Activism, Reimagining Whiteness. I want to start with, uh, and this will be on the screen, just a few of the questions uh, we got in feedback from all of you earlier in the summer. Uh, these are just some of the questions that were related to this idea between art, and what does art have to do with activism? How does art energize us? Uh, can we explore art as a positive force? What's the role of art in transforming cultural change? How can the arts be an expression of care for the environment? Was Jesus an artist? Um, so the sermon is uh, an indirect attempt to respond to these wonderful questions. So like some of you, I'm trying to limit the amount of news I consume. I don't mean that I'm checking out or going numb. I just mean that the nonstop churn of troubling news is more than I can sustain as a human being on some days. So you don't need me to name the list, but between issues relating to women's reproductive health, mass shootings, Ukraine, inflation, January 6th hearings, this news cycle can leave us despairing, cynical, and bewildered. So I think these questions you all raise about the relevance of art, of creativity, of making, these are really good questions. Is it a good use of our time to celebrate the making and enjoying of art when there are so many life and death issues in play? Might it be a little frivolous to feature art to foreground creativity when the world is coming apart? Now we'll get to art and activism in a second, but let me double down on these questions first. We'll come up for air, I promise. There was a recent article in The Atlantic entitled, A Crisis Historian Has Some Bad News for Us. The article is about the work of a guy named Adam Tooze. Uh, he's a historian of economic disaster. I didn't know you could have that as a title, but he does. According to Tooze, the forces of central bank tightening, war, inflation, and climate change are all reinforcing one another. And he has a name for this. It's a polycrisis. You thought it was bad to be in crisis. Well, now you have a polycrisis. Yes, we might be nearing the end of the coronavirus pandemic, but twos isn't at all sure we're emerging from the crisis. Quote, indeed, we might be in a worsening one in which much of the world faces a series of self-reinforcing financial and geopolitical pressures, building perhaps to some ominous end. For twos, contemporary life feels like data overwhelm, like, quote, bathing in an anarchic, unstoppable flow of information. So here we are, facing the doom of a polycrisis, overwhelmed by torrents of data. And so the questions, I take it, are sort of along the lines of, is this really a time for frills and decoration and prettiness? One more, and then we'll get to some good news. There's this uh, charismatic polymath named Balaji Srinivasan. He was asked recently where he sees America in five years. He said, quote, it will be Black Lives Matter and January 6th all the time. I don't quote him here because I think he's right. He's selling books, and so we should probably take him with a grain of salt. Srinivasan is brilliant. He has electrical and chemical engineering degrees from Stanford, but he shows very little ability to parse out some of the important moral differences between, say, Black Lives Matter and January 6th assault on the Capitol. Even so, Srinivasan does name one of the more disturbing possibilities in our American future, namely that our shared cultural lives will shift from being occasionally tumultuous to being permanently so. Okay, enough catastrophizing? Everybody got their foot fill? All right, all right, let's move on then. Our reading today 
is from Romans 5, uh, verses 1 through 5. So listen now for God's voice speaking to you. Therefore, since we have been made righteous through his faithfulness, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand through him, and we boast in the hope of God's glory. But not only that, we even take pride in our problems because we know that trouble produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. This hope doesn't put us to shame because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. Just a couple of comments about our reading for this morning. Paul is making an argument and you don't have to just drink it down without thinking. You can welcome it as a sacred imaginative possibility. It goes something like this, by living in the wake of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we live in peace with God. Okay, so far forth, that's a pretty basic picture of faith's good news. But the passage gets our attention when Paul continues, quote, we even take pride in our problems. Hmm. This might be the point at which you want to call time out. Let me think about this a little bit. Now, I don't read Paul as suggesting that problems, pain, and suffering ought to be welcomed as goods in themselves. I think something a little different, a little more subtle is going on. By taking pride even in our problems, we confess that our difficulties can be the domain in which we embody our hope. Our problems put us in a position where we have a range of options. We can become angry and sullen. We can despair and give up. Or we can learn to live from the love of God that's been poured out into our hearts. We can find a group of friends with whom to work for a better world. Maybe that's why you're here. That's why I'm here. And maybe God has called us together today so that we can decide together, prayerfully, whether our country's troubles, our community's troubles, and our own personal troubles are going to isolate us and shut us down, or whether they might connect us to one another and energize all of us for hopeful work together. So I want to draw your attention this morning to three uh, different artists. All of them embody hope in hard times. Each of them is articulate about what's wrong, and each offers an artful call into a new way of life. You won't be surprised by what I want to say today. You've heard me enough this summer. I want to say that art can nurture activism, that hopeful work is usually fueled by a renewed imagination. Art, like the good news of faith itself, can help us get into imaginative postures and into relational coalitions that aim to embody God's love and justice here in our own time and place. So today, I give you a poem, another poem, by Amanda Gorman, some paintings by Kehinda Wiley, and another little story from George Saunders' fiction. So I want to begin by this poem. We, uh, our early prayers of the liturgy were shaped by Amanda Gorman's poems. Uh, this one that I want to draw your attention to next is entitled, Back to the Past. And it will be on the screen so you can see it as I read it. At times, even blessings will bleed us. There are some who lost their lives and those who were lost from ours, who we might now re-enter. All our someones summoned softly. The closest we get to time travel is our fears softening, our hurts unclenching, as we become more akin to kin, as we return to who we were, before we actually were anything or anyone. That is, when we were born unhating and unhindered, howling wetly with everything we could yet become. To travel back in time is to remember when all we knew of ourselves was love. I think that poem's worth reading. It's probably worth rereading, too. And maybe some of you will, uh, your takeaway from the week, or from the sermon anyway, will just be, to use this poem as a kind of daily prayer for the week. I think that'd be a good way to use it. And I promise you I won't strangle the whole thing, just a couple of parts. Of course, the poem isn't about activism. It doesn't fund any particular course of action. It can't and doesn't try to tell you what to believe or what's worth doing. It's more like a summons, her word, an invitation 
Not a summons to religion, not to someone else's agenda, not to conformity to some doctrine or some party platform. No, it's an invitation to move forward by moving down deeper into who we are. It doesn't yell or argue. Instead, it's softer than that. All our someones are summoned softly. The poem imagines that time travel is a way of living into the future by gathering up versions of ourselves we had once, quote, when we were born unhating and unhindered. It's hard, especially when we're stressed or angry or frustrated or confused like so many of us now. It's hard to imagine that there was a time when all we knew of ourselves was love, but that's possible, and I hope it's true. But even if it's true, it's certainly not obvious, right? Maybe we'll only know whether it's true or not if we experiment with it, play with it, act it out, try it on. That's what poetry's for. This is art aimed at making a difference in how we live. A poem aimed at eliciting a life in which we feel, quote, our fears softening and our hurts unclenching. From a poem, let me move to a few paintings. And the painter, Kahinda Wiley, you might recognize the portrait he made of former President Barack Obama. And this is where he came to a lot of people's attention. This will be up on the screen. And I'll show you several more in just a minute, but Alex, you can leave that one up here. Growing up, while he was interested in art, he spent time in museums, and he says that as a black man, he was unable to see himself reflected in that art world, in the museum world, so he set about to make a change. His paintings reimagine other famous paintings, but he substitutes contemporary African-American men or women for traditional white figures. Such images challenge viewers to think about the dynamics of status, of race, of representation. As Wiley puts it, quote, my works quote, historical sources and position young black men within the field of power. Wiley's signature portraits of everyday men and women riff on specific paintings by old masters, replacing the European aristocrats depicted in those classic paintings with contemporary black subjects, drawing attention to the absence of African Americans from historical and cultural narratives the people in Wiley's paintings often wear sneakers, hoodies, and baseball caps, gear associated with hip-hop culture, and then are set against contrasting, ornate, decorative backgrounds that evoke earlier areas, eras and other cultures. So today, I want you just to see, uh, we won't spend long on them, but there's six paintings from what Wiley entitled his Scenic Series. Uh, this, these six paintings is comprised of portraits inspired by portraits he saw uh, made originally by German Renaissance painter Hans Holbein the Younger in the 16th century. Um, so these will be quick. We won't spend a lot of time on them, but uh, you'll get a sense of how he paints. So first, uh, a painting of St. Andrew. Um, these are all from 2006. Next, a painting uh, entitled Charles I and Henrietta Maria. So you could find right, European examples of people posed in similar ways. Some of them by Hans Holbein. Next, design for a stained glass window with wild man. Then the apostle Peter. And then Charles I at the hunt. Um, and, and then, so next, I want to go to uh, one of Hans Holbein's works. So the next one will be St. Adrian, a 16th century painting by German Hans Holbein. So it may be hard to see, but uh, um, the figure's holding a sword and an anvil, which are symbols of power and heroism. So just to give you a sense of the playfulness of Wiley's work, then next is St. Adrian by Kehinda Wiley also from 2006. Again, the figures holding the sword and the anvil as in Holbein's original image. And I bet some of you who visit the Nelson Atkins recognize this, because that's where it is. And Alex, you probably can just leave that one up there for a minute. Again, Wiley, as a painter, isn't telling us what to believe or what to do. He isn't asking us to sign up for this or that political party or this or that protest, instead he creates an unexpected mashup of imagery that calls our assumptions about whiteness and power into question. 
Young black men aren't supposed to strike the same poses as European aristocrats and ancient saints, are they? But here they are, and they won't go away. And they invite us to reconsider some of the ways we've identified power and class with European values and with white American ways of life. In the new world that Wiley helps us imagine in these paintings, Young black men in street fashion are as worthy of respect and admiration as any saint or king. And in that sense, the paintings summon us, there's Gorman's phrase, summon us into a new relationship with ourselves and others. They stir our hope and give us some good work to do. So poems, paintings, and finally let me turn to one more story from a novel that I dealt with last week in the fiction of George Saunders. So last week I talked about his novel entitled Lincoln in the Bardo. It's an odd story about ghosts who don't know they're dead. It's set during the Civil War. And I didn't really say anything last week about how the novel speaks to reimagining whiteness in the wake of America's race problem. But Saunders is particularly good at holding before us the various human knots that will need to be untied if there is to be any genuine hope for a shared future. And I'll admit, sometimes Saunders' writing about our distorted entanglements with one another is so persuasive, it shades towards hopelessness, an inculcation of deadening, paralyzing despair. Almost, but not quite. The novel takes up slavery as a basic human problem and then leads us round it and round it again, making sure we see the knot from all its grisly angles. Saunders' story is interested in the ways slavery deformed both masters and slaves, and he suggests that these racialized, violent deformations of human possibilities continue even into the afterlife, taking on cosmic scope, webbing out and down into our very capacity to hope and to pray. Saunders gives us a novel that shows us not just slavery in individual frameworks and personal dimensions, he also wants us to see the broader frame in which we, the host nation that legalizes, blesses, and reinforces such a system, becomes itself its own difficult knot. Reading Saunders, one can only conclude that any kind of American praying will always and essentially be a racialized kind of praying. The Civil War is not just mere setting or backdrop for the novel. It becomes the blood in the novel's veins, the fabric from which it's woven. At one point, Saunders introduces us to a group of ghosts who had all been enslaved. Thomas Havens, one ghost, begins his story by telling us that his white slave masters, the Connor family, quote, were like family to me. Now, he was never separated from his wife or children. He ate well. He wasn't beaten often. He had a small yellow yellow cottage of his own even. Quote, I endeavored to be a good and honorable servant, he says. Of course, there was always a moment, just as an order was given, when a small resistant voice would make itself known in the back of my mind. It wasn't a defiant or angry voice particularly, just that little human voice saying, you know, I wish to do what I wish to do and not what you're telling me to do. He breaks off, not wanting to complain, and then he adds that he did have some free time. Some Wednesday afternoons, he would get two hours free, for example. And every third Sunday, unless things came up and he was needed, which often happened, interruptions came on these Wednesdays and third Sundays, quote, or late upon any night at all as I was enjoying an intimate moment with my wife, or was lost in much needed sleep, or was praying, or was in the privy. Yes, he had discretionary moments here and there, he admits. Quote, strange though, it's the memory of those free moments that bothers me most. The thought, specifically, that other men, white men, enjoyed whole lifetimes comprised of such moments, end quote. Later in the novel, President Lincoln has visited the crypt, the grave of his young son, Willie, who died of typhoid fever, and he's leaving the cemetery, and some of the African-American ghosts are there in the area, and they step out of his way. Thomas Havens, on the other hand, overcome with a rash boldness, stood directly in the president's path. As a ghost, he can inhabit other bodies, and he does so. Deciding to stay on a bit in President Lincoln's body, Havens inhabits Lincoln and remains within the president even as the president mounts his horse and heads back home. This act of the black 
Havens inhabiting the white president allows Havens, the ghost, to feel Lincoln's emotional struggles and to think his own thoughts within the president's psyche. What a thrill it was, says Havens, of inhabiting the president, to be doing what I wished without having been ordered to do so, without having sought anyone's permission. And here I quote at length what Havens feels as he continues to ride along inside the president, and this will be on the screen. And yet I was comfortable in there and suddenly wanted him, the president, to know me, my life, to know us, our lot. I don't know why I felt that way, but I did. All of us, white and black, had made him sadder with our sadness. And now, though it sounds strange to say, he was making me sadder with his sadness. And I thought, well, sir, if we're going to make a sadness party of it, I have some sadness about which I think someone as powerful as you might like to know. And I thought then, as hard as I could, of all I'd heard during our long occupancy in that pit regarding their many troubles and degradations, thinking, sir, if you're as powerful as I feel that you are and as inclined towards us as you seem to be, endeavor to do something for us so that we might do something for ourselves. We are ready, sire, are angry, are capable. Our hopes are coiled up so tight as to be deadly or holy. Turn us loose, sire. Let us at it. Let us show what we can do." End quote. A good writer might write for an entire lifetime and never write a paragraph this empathetically brilliant. Here rides President Lincoln, all his sadness exponentially squared, the sadness of his young sons dying, multiplied by the sadness of all the ways that slavery had degraded both blacks and whites. Here Saunders has attempted to give us the knot, to make us look at the knot, to feel it even, how tightly it's been drawn, perhaps even to make us despair of it ever loosening, and yet here is this scene of passionate hope. The president rides out of the cemetery inhabited by a slave, Thomas Havens, who asks the president to do what will enable black lives to do something for themselves. He prays for a political structure that will enable black agency and black flourishing. And Havens' testimony from the depths of black suffering might be an anthem that transcends just that particular moment. We're ready, he says. Angry and capable, he says. Our hope is coiled and ready to be loosed. Give us a chance to show what we can do. I can't speak for you, but when I immerse myself in the poetry of Amanda Gorman, in the paintings of Kehinda Wiley, and the fiction of George Saunders, I become a new person, freshly situated in a different world. Their imagery, like our scripture reading from today, beckons me into a new way of being. Their craft appeals to my desire, persuading me towards a better, more hopeful version of myself. God's spirit has been poured into our hearts, and when we live from the heart, we can hear God's call to faith embodied in activism and justice. And when we're living that way together, all different kinds of art, the ones we've covered today and lots of others besides, can become gifts for the journey. So for all these gifts and for all the ways we are called into the world, we give thanks. Amen.
Thank you, Choir. That was, that was stunning. Um, I'm David Warm. Uh, I currently serve on session and as chair of our personnel committee, and in that role I want to extend gratitude on behalf of this congregation for Nick Pickerel's outstanding contribution to the life of this congregation and our ministry. Um, as Nick and has shared over eight years ago, he was hired to help us imagine a new worshiping community, which was part of our strategic goal as a congregation. I was lucky enough to be on the interview committee that hired Nick, as he recalls that it was an audition, so I guess I was one of the judges in America's Got Talent, and we found some. <laughs> we found some. Actually, I remember really distinctly calling one of his references. I was tasked with that. And I, I remember being told that in, in Nick was innovative and energetic and has an innate ability to connect with people and to build a sense of community. And he has proven that extraordinarily over the last eight years. When, when he was hired, I mean, Nick didn't just come up with the open table. When he was hired, he engaged all of us and many people in the community in listening sessions and discernment and dreaming about what this new Christian community could look like. And the open table was launched in March 8 of 2015. Uh, over the last seven years, it has created a space for hospitality, conversation, peace, and reconciliation in Kansas City. It's been one of the fastest growing new worshiping communities in the Presbyterian Church USA. That's worth pausing and reflecting on. And it's also served as a model for new worshiping communities in the PCUSA and been a residency site for many people who are called to ministry. The Open Table has become known locally and nationally for its anti-racism work and trainings over the last few years. It's led anti-racism training for over 80 organizations and 10,000 people, including everybody in the Presbytery. Many of you have probably participated, as I have, in that really meaningful experience. Second, and the Open Table's relationship has continued to deepen and involve with communities over time um, and learning across the new worshiping communities and building up a movement, if you will, about how we can move into the future with new forms of worship in church. Um, he, uh, he's currently in conversation, the entire leadership team of the Open Table is currently in conversation with our session and with the subgroup of session that is focusing on how our relationship can be deepened and strengthened over time. And we are looking forward as a congregation, I know we are at session, to learn with and grow with the Open tail Table as it begins this new chapter. He's done an exceptional job and, and we wanna thank you, Nick, for, for your vision, your leadership, and your commitment to opening our doors to people who are seeking new avenues to belong to a community of faith and meaning. He has also helped to attract some new leadership to the movement, and one of those new leaders is Dr. Latia Frazier. She will lead the new transition of the open table to a new future, as I think we're gonna hear in a moment. She's a New York City native, has a master's and doctoral degree uh, from the Nazarene Theological Seminary in Kansas City. Those of you who have heard her preach uh, know that she's passionate about the intersections between faith and race and disability. She's been an active organizer in many initiatives, including the Kansas Poor People's Campaign, a national model for moral revival, and a disabilities right advocate in her own right, as well as a hospital chaplain. She is an ordained Nazarene pastor, and she's currently in the process of switching her ordination to the PCUSA, and we'll be working with Presbytery to meet those ordination, uh, hopes to complete uh, that process next year. So we welcome her to her new role, um, and, and we look forward to working alongside her to help the open table continue to thrive as it grows into its next uh, vision. So the development of these new kinds of innovative ministries um, would not be possible without your generous support. To give today, as always, text your phone number or scan the QR code on the screen. You can drop off donations in the box on the side of the sanctuary. And, you, uh, and, you, and, we, and I want to thank on behalf of Session and everybody who is in this space to thank each other for our generosity, ties, and offerings and pledges, which allow us to fulfill our mission to love God, ourselves, and others, whoever, however, wherever they are, with a love that transforms us all. Nick, thank you. David. 
Nick, will you join me up here, please? Our prayer time this morning um, will be a prayer of thanksgiving, but also a prayer of blessing uh, for Nick as he's finishing his work as an organizer at the open uh, table. So you have a role here. I need you to participate in a couple ways. There's a refrain. So when I say, O oh Lord, your part is we give you thanks. Let's try it. O oh Lord, we give you thanks. Great job. The other thing I need you to do is I am going to, don't be afraid to be, I need, I need to want to touch you. Okay. <laughs> so I, I get a hand on the shoulder. If you will extend a hand or two or both hands or whatever feels good to you, in blessing and warmth to Nick and be ready for your part. Friends, let us give thanks to the Lord who is good. O Lord, we give you thanks for the good world, for things great and small, beautiful and awesome, for seen and unseen splendors. O Lord, we give you thanks for human life, for talking and moving and thinking together, for common hopes and hardships shared from birth until death, O oh Lord, we give you thanks for work to do and strength to work, for the solidarity of labor, for exchanges of good humor and encouragement. O oh Lord, we give you thanks for our friend and coworker Nick, who dreamed of a new kind of community where ideas and actions mix, where thinkers and laborers mingle and become friends. O oh Lord, we give you thanks for Nick's dedication to the open table all these years for the courage and vulnerability required to start something new, for the continual resilience and sacrifice in the face of stress and struggle, O oh Lord, we give you thanks. For all those impacted by Nick's leadership and ministry, for the relationships that have been formed, for lives changed, for people waking afresh into their callings and identities, O oh Lord, we give you thanks. For the next chapter of Nick's life and work, for his recovery and rest, and for the deepening of his calling as he embodies his gladness in new ways. O oh Lord, we give you thanks. For the church into which we've all been called, for the good news we receive by word and sacrament for our life together in you, Lord. O oh Lord, we give you thanks. For your Holy Spirit who guides our steps and brings us the gifts of faith and love, who prays in us and prompts our grateful worship. O oh Lord, we give you thanks. Above all, O oh God, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died and lives again for our salvation, for our hope in him, and for the joy of serving him together. O oh Lord, we give you thanks. Amen. Nick, I want to present you with this gift. It involves beer and sushi, uh, with the help of your partner, Sarah, who had some good ideas. Thank you for all the good work you do. And Rev, yes, yes. you to sit down because I want to ask the Reverend Dr. Latia if you will stand up for just a moment so everyone can see you if they haven't met you. This is Latia and she will be the next organizer of the open table. So will you also please welcome her to her new work. <laughs> Don't ask her where she gets her t-shirts. She won't tell you because she doesn't want you to get them. I already tried. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. What is next? Are we singing? Yes. We're singing. We're singing. <laughs> we sure are singing. Go ahead and stand up if you, if you may. Uh, we're going to sing hymn number 804, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart, verses 1 through 4. Oh! 
we do have reason to rejoice. Uh, God is good to us. The high schoolers had a great mission adventure in Alaska, the good work of the open table. Um, so, friends, and I want you to know I was tempted, but I did not check my phone once for the Wimbledon score. <laughs> but I will run out of here and do that next. But in the meantime, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you as you leave this place. Go in peace, in love and joy to serve the Lord. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.